Good morning. How many of you build websites or applications or something for clients? Okay, just about everybody. And who maybe does Drupal inside of a larger organization? Something like that. How many of you have to convince people at some point or another to use Drupal? Right, you have to sell what you do, right? So a lot of us, oh, okay. Now, how many of you have a purely business background and you've come into Drupal because of the big money? <laughs> yeah, and how many of you have a computer science background or you learned how to make a website and then figured out that people would pay money for that, right? You don't be shy, it's cool. That's where I came from too. So here's the problem, and this is why it's called Selling business value, not shiny widgets. What are we really excited about in Drupal 8? We are really excited that um, we can use dependency injection, that um, the logging interface lets us use monologue with Drupal 8 now instead of Drupal's native logging solution, that the, the, the data is um, put together in uh, schema.org schemas that, uh, right? Amazing, object-oriented code, hooray. Our clients don't care. Anyone who you're selling to probably doesn't care about that stuff. And what they do care about is the value that they're going to get out of that. So in terms of talking with clients, in terms of building your own businesses, what I've, what I've tried to do today is take uh, 10 new feature areas, 10 feature areas that where Drupal 8 goes above and beyond Drupal 7, um, and explain them in terms of the business value that they deliver to your clients, to your business, if you're in a larger organization, like maybe what it does for developers, what it does for managers, and so on, to talk about what all this cool technology is delivering, because we as geeks, we get way too excited about, about this, like how it works, and, and forget the bigger picture sometimes. So, everybody calls me Jam, please call me Jam today, it's fine. Um, I'm very easy to find online. Um, I have a very active channel with the Acquia podcast, and I'm about to re-syndicate that to a new feed, so if any of you listen to it, watch out for that. Um, I've been writing a series of blog posts this year called the Drupal 8 module of the week um, that I've been had a lot of fun doing, and um, I'm expanding that series to include themes and distributions now. So if you've upgraded something from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, or if you've written something cool for Drupal 8, I'd love to talk about it. And um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a really good chance that we could um, turn that into a blog post with your name and links to your company on it. I would love to, do, I would love to help you out if you've done that stuff with Drupal 8. Um, thank you also to the organizers of the camp for getting me here. Um, uh, this is, Yo-Yo, uh, how many times did you invite me so far? Yeah, I'm sorry. I always had a conflict before. I'm really, really, really happy to be here. I'm, I'm really, really grateful that we could make that happen. Um, I, uh, I need your help to keep... Do so well, I'll talk about what my job is. So my title is cool, I think, Evangelist Developer Relations, um, but what I actually get to do in my day-to-day -day job, I think, is, is, is actually truly... Um, I'm really, really grateful to be able to do that. I'm convinced that I'm not getting power through my computer. Uh, so my day job at Acquia is in developer relations now, and that means I want to connect you with useful information. I want to make your day better. I want to inspire you. I want to help you solve a problem. I want to help you find resources that will let you work better, let your company function better, and so on. Yeah, so developer relations, and I need your help doing one thing today towards the end of the presentation. This link uh, goes to a survey, which is one question. And if you could answer me that question later on, I'll put the link up again. But if you could answer that one question, it would help me um, a lot back at work um, and help me keep doing my job, keep coming to events and so on, would be awesome. So why are we all here? Well, 
Drupal 7, right? We did really, really well with that. I think that's an interesting number. 5% of all websites with an identifiable CMS are Drupal. Um, you know, Drupal.org has more than a million user accounts. <laughs> My marketing department loves to say that. Um, realistically, there are probably 100, 150,000 active accounts. And depending on how you count active, you know, maybe that number is only 80,000. But that's an awful lot of people, right? And we have more than 30,000 active developer accounts. So, um, you know, when you're selling Drupal, like let's start right away. When you're selling Drupal to someone and, and you're a small shop, you can actually tell people like, this is, this is uh, DrupalCon Austin, that's me. Um, this is what 10% of our developer community looks like. This is 3,000 people, right? When you hire me, you're hiring 30,000 other people to help you out. And you've got you know, 15 years of coding millions of hours of coding behind you. So, you know, Drupal's done really, really well. There are a ton of case studies. There are a ton of really, really important sites, really, really big sites, all built on Drupal 7. That's why we're still here. That's why we're still a community. Um, and, you know, not necessarily because Drupal 8 took, you know, most of six years to get out the door. This time last year, think back a year ago, summer 2015, were you really super, super ultra excited about Drupal? You were. OK. <laughs> um, I found it really, really hard. DrupalCon Barcelona, I found really hard. Um, you know, everybody was like, oh god. You know, what can we, how can we, you know, I had been going around for a couple of years um, and essentially I realized if I felt like I was selling vaporware at that point. I'd been going around. We were in a client pitch um, in Germany and talking about what Drupal 8 can do. And they're like, stop, 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 stop. Fine. When? How do you know it's going to be able to do all these things? Well, we have this community. We have all these people. And it's like, none of the modules are there. The release isn't there. You know, stop it. Right? It was a really, really frustrating year. Um, so. And Dries uh, conceived of most of what Drupal 8 would become, you know, a very long time ago. And people like Larry Garfield um, and, and many, 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 many others who conceived of what Drupal 8 uh, was going to become, right? A lot of that dreaming and thinking and planning happened five years ago or six years or seven years ago. Can Drupal 8 even live up to the success that Drupal 7 has had? you know, being our main release for more than five years, is it too late? Are we releasing the technology from five years ago? That's a really, really scary proposition. Um, you know, is anybody going to adopt this stuff that we've built? Um, I want to talk about that today. Um, and I will, I will say straight out of the gate, I contend that we have the right set of technologies at the right time and that we're poised for um, great success with this uh, release and it's going to... Um, make it possible, for, I think, for us to grow and succeed way beyond how we ever did with Drupal 7. Angie Byron and I um, just redid this little thing called the Ultimate Guide to Drupal 8. Um, and if you want a document for potential clients, for people who want to know about Drupal 8 in general to read, this has been updated as of Drupal 8.1 at this point. It's a nice high-level overview. It talks about a lot of the things I'm going to be talking about today and a few more and in a slightly, from a slightly different perspective, but um, check that out. Uh, it's, um, you know, I certainly invest, invested a bunch of time in it and um, a, a lot of people have told me that it's been, you know, helpful. So now I'm going to start talking about 10 feature areas, it, the things that are all new and Drupal 8 and, and what you can get out of them. Um, all of this builds on Drupal 7. Things that Drupal 7 could already do, I'm not going to talk about those much. Um, let's just assume that basically if you could do it in Drupal 7, you, you can do it in Drupal 8 too. So, and what I'm going to try and do is talk about this in terms of business value that it's delivering. And my, my thought process is here, what, what I'm trying to practice here is, is thinking, as I said, you know, thinking about what do clients get out of it, what do developers get out of it, what do management get out of it, and so on. And I'm going to try and also turn this into actual um, blog posts and some, something that you can download. And, and I'm really hoping that you can use it to help your business and help all of our community grow. So 
language support. Gabor Hoichi is coming later today, later today, right? Um, he and a lot of other people did absolutely amazing work making multilingual in Drupal 8 uh, incredible. Out of the box, solid, totally, completely functional, out of the gate, starting with the fact that you don't need to install Drupal in English anymore. But, you know, from the second click, or if you build an installation pro profile, like from when you, t when, you, when you start running it, you can have Drupal in your own language now. And um, so in Drupal 7, we needed, um, poof, who built Drupal 7 multilingual sites? Yeah, so, you know, we needed 27 modules, 30 modules, I mean, depending on how you did it. You need a ton of modules to make multilingual happen in Drupal 7, and we did it really well, right? But none of the modules were written at the same time, none of them worked the same way, they were built to scratch different itches, so for whatever reason, content translation was only for nodes, and it makes, you know, copies of them to do it. Entity translation was something else, variables, localization, it was, it was really, really uh, heavy to deal with. And when you download Drupal 8 right out of the box, you have four modules that allow you to granularly configure any multilingual use case that, um, that anybody's thought of so far. And of course, it's extensible and configurable. So uh, those of us who live in countries with multiple official languages or those of us who want to do business with you know, who wants Swiss clients, yes, please, um, Belgian clients, um, Italy has multiple official languages. India has 22 official languages. Um, Drupal now, out of the box, can serve all of these constituencies amazingly well. And I've been talking with people who've been practicing building these sites, and uh, someone like Michael Schmidt, for example, Schnitzel from Amazy Labs, says that uh, his team is getting used to working with the potential of this thing, but he's absolutely certain that over time it's going to give them incredible advantages in uh, speed and quality of delivery. I mean, just think about it as developers for a second. We're going to come back to this a lot today, but under the hood, everything is consistent now. Everything is built the same way. So you just turn this stuff on and configure it, and you can go. So multilingual in Drupal 8, this delivers incredible um, selling power in multilingual countries, government projects, and if you want to sell outside of Slovakia, great for you. Mobile first is almost hard to talk about now. I mean, and, and it seemed like a big deal. Five or six years ago in DrupalCon Denver when Dries announced the mobile first initiative, like um, the number of people accessing the internet on their pocket supercomputers right, was nothing like it is today. It was, uh, we were talking about, you know, the, the, when the graph is going to cross, cross over between people on their desktop and, and people on their mobiles, devices sometime in 2017, you know, we thought that mobile access would eclipse uh, desktop access. Of course, it happened a few years ago, and, you know, depending on what country you're in, 65, 85% of accessing the internet happens here now. Um, we weren't in the world of apps yet. Okay, and yet, um, we've gotten this right, yeah? So, <clears throat> Drupal 7 basically assumed that you were using a computer on your desktop with a big screen, and um, there, it, it wasn't responsive out of the box, and uh, it was, you know, you could make it do web services, but it wasn't great uh, for web services, um, and, and Drupal 8 fixes all of that. Um, just by, uh, and here's another interesting theme with Drupal 8, we've kind of opened our platform, we've open sourced our open source, so that we've outsourced all sorts of commodity functionality, um, and by, by doing so, by adopting Symfony and Twig and HTML5 and, and, and keeping up to date with PHP, um, we've gotten a lot of stuff for free, we've gotten a lot of upgrades for free, which is, you know, a big theme that, that we talk about in open source. Um, but just because we use HTML5, um, you know, the, the, those of us who work in the front end, like, we have to worry so much less about this, um, and we can spend a lot more time swearing at all of the different versions of the damn iOS screens that come out, you know, um, but we get offline caching for free, which, which makes incredibly exciting, interesting app-like um, websites possible now, built-in audio-video, all of it's, you know, done by itself. 
It's cleaner, it's easier to work with, it's amazing, and it's made to work with mobile out of the box. We adopted responsive design, and so, you know, whenever your viewport changes, all of the themes that come with Drupal 8, and anyone who's building themes in Drupal 8 now essentially is building them responsive. This is huge for us. This lets you choose whether to have a nice responsive website or make an app or something in between, but Drupal 8 is simply ready to be displayed on any viewport, and that's fantastic. That means, um, you know, somebody, a client who can't afford a native app, you can still give them a really, really great experience. Editing Drupal 7 websites on your phone. How much fun was that? <laughs> right? Yeah. So it looked like this, right? Impossible, impossible to work with. So even the administrative themes, uh, theme in Drupal 8 is responsive out of the box, and it does some neat tricks along the way, like it'll turn the menu icons, uh, the, the menu items into icons instead of words. Um, it takes advantage of the responsive tables that we've got in Drupal 8, which allow you to create tables and then assign them priorities so that as the viewport gets narrower, you can decide which order they uh, go off the screen. Um, there's a nice, there's a nice, contrib module called uh, responsive and off canvas menu that'll allow you to have a menu displayed on the properly on the big on the in the wide version but then it'll just throw it off the screen and give it you give it to you with a little hamburger menu instead i mean there's lots of fun stuff going on but right out of the box drupal 8 just works on mobile and in our world today that's really really huge um, i'll talk about this a couple times today but i won't really um, give it as much time as I think it. Uh, I think it's 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 more important than than how much I'm going to talk about it today. But um, Drupal 8 is restful. It can. You, you, these things are in core. When you turn them on, you know you can ingest any web service, any data source into your Drupal 8 site, manage that content, and then output it in any number of ways. And this is giving the game away. Mm, to some degree, but you know the ability to be the ability to be uh, you know to handle to be restful in 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 any way you need to allows you to build all of these different kind of CMS app different sort of models. Uh, this is a slide from my friends at Pantheon. Thank you very much. Um, it allows you also, uh, we built a pseudo conceptual app for Symphony Live last year, so it allows me to write my specialist Symphony application, um, for example, and, and this is, becomes really, really important for large organizations. Um, I can uh, do single sign on somewhere else, I can do my CRM stuff somewhere else, but I have Drupal 8 here, right, doing what it does best which is managing content, inputting and outputting. All of my content authors can work in a consistent uh, editing environment. Um, I can, of course, it makes a lovely website, but at the same time, okay, the same data, the same systems, I can put them into some trendy front-end framework, I can put them into native apps, and for the content teams, there is a single canonical data source, I'm only doing things and fixing things in one single place. I don't have to make sure that I edit the M version and the standard version and the app repository and everything along the way. Drupal 8 can just be the back end to all of this. So um, the buzzword here that I'm really, really excited about is that Drupal 8 gives you a UI for building today's web-based businesses. Look, who knows how to make a view? Right. So there's a view display option now, which um, turns the um, <sighs> turns any view into a rest endpoint, right? So all of the content you've managed, any way you want to display it with views, right, is automatically a web service. It's automatically an API. You can build a Drupal website that produces a digital business, an API, right? Out of the box, it, it's, it's an API building UI. This is an incredible, incredible power that we've got now. So, accessibility. Anybody who works with government, accessibility is incredibly important. It's always written into the regulations of working for government clients. It's allowed Drupal to succeed wildly around the world. Um, 
and, and be used by local governments all over the UK, but be adopted by something like 25, 24, 25 percent of all US government websites. The government Australia of Australia is standardizing on a Drupal distribution called GovCMS. This is great for your business if you want to work with government. Drupal's very popular with government, so this is a great place to work. Um, there are 285 million visually impaired people on the web, um, according to some sources, and Drupal 7 already did great with it. Um, because we now have the Y ARIA markup, alternative browsers know exactly the function of all the given page elements and can then help screen readers present them better, help visually impaired users navigate them better. Hey, presto! What is the benefit of having extremely clearly structured uh, pages behind the browser? Who else besides visually impaired users loves well-structured data? Search engines. So if you build great accessibility, um, you're building, from a machine perspective, you're automatically building great uh, usability, and therefore, you're actually, you can get a lot, of, a lot of benefit out of that. Plus, honestly, it's the right thing to do, um, and there's no reason not to. And Drupal comes with all of this right out of the box. Uh, the, the accessibility team put an amazing amount of work into it, um, and uh, it's, been, it's been great to observe. If you're going to build a website of any you know, importance of any consequence, anything that needs to be big or that could be big if you succeed at it, you really, really need to make sure that it's going to be fast enough, right? And you really need to know that it can scale. And um, <clears throat> if you look at the raw PHP benchmarking for Drupal 8, it, it, it doesn't really run very fast, okay? And then... Um, but on the other hand, um, it's got all these incredible features that I think more than make up for that. And also, you know, raw, simple, plain PHP benchmarking is, is, is of course not how we run things in the real world anyway. So um, more precise caching uh, is uh, a very, very short way of, of talking about the, the work that uh, uh, Wim Leers and uh, Fabian Franz have done around uh, caching in Drupal 8. So, so this concept of cache tags, um, which is which is kind of mind blowing to me. So in Drupal 7, um, we had the page cache, right? And when the when the something on a page uh, invalidated the cache, what did we do? We flushed the whole cache and then loaded everything afresh and rebuilt the whole cache. And that's the level of granularity that we had um, with Drupal 8. Every element on the page, uh, Drupal, um, it has caching metadata called cache tags. Drupal knows when those individual pieces of cache are invalidated and refreshes only those and leaves everything alone. And it enables us to do some cool tricks that I'm about to show you. Um, thanks to HTML5, we get client-side caching as well. So we can offload some of the work up into the browser and not worry about it. And because we're compatible with up-to-date versions of PHP and PHP runtimes, right, we get this incredible boost in performance. And by the time, you know, we run, we run uh, consistently on PHP uh, 7, you know, Drupal is going to be running uh, significantly faster even than, than 5.6, which, which runs uh, way, way faster than the versions of PHP that we were running on only a couple of years ago. So just by keeping up with our friends in PHP, Drupal is actually running faster and faster, and that's fantastic. So, so this cache tagging that I was talking about allows us to do this uh, fun, fun couple of tricks uh, in and around dynamic content substitution. So as of Drupal 8.1, big pipe comes delivered as an experimental module with Drupal core. Who knows about Big Pipe? Mm. Who thinks it's the probably the second coolest thing that's ever been delivered with Drupal? And those of you who don't, it's maybe just because you don't know what it is yet. <laughs> um, so the net effect of Big Pipe is that when your caches are warm, your page is delivered in exactly the same amount of time as they would be without Big Pipe. Amazing, right? 
Are you awake? Yeah, so what happens is, these, so with these cache tags, right, my Drupal 8 site knows uh, what's dynamic on my page and what's static on my page. And what do my visit, when somebody comes to my website, right, what do, my, what do my visitors actually care about? They found me on Google, they've been somewhere and they're looking. My, 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 my site users care about this article and this image probably, okay? So look, same page load time. But when, but now Drupal knows that this stuff is static and it's not changing at all and it delivers those two things in a quarter of a second, okay? And then it worries about, hey, my current musical listening list and my friends are doing this thing and now I have to go and check my user roles and permissions to see, oh, I'm allowed to comment, let me generate the comment thing, right? In Drupal 7 and without Big Pipe in place, that all takes... Six point three seconds. Drupal generates everything and then delivers the page with Big Pipe and this dynamic content substitution concept. Right, the stuff that's static, boom, it's already there. And then everything that's going to come later, it's delivered when it's ready and when it's rendered. And um, so this is this is called a perceived performance boost. And uh, the concept was developed at Facebook and uh, uh, wonderfully, beautifully extended by Wim and Fabian for Drupal eight. Um, so, so this is a, a huge, huge, um, and we're the only CMS, the only system um, um, that's doing anything like this, um, and it's because we have this amazing caching. So, so this perceived performance concept is really, really interesting, and yet Drupal 8 also simply performs faster, and the latest thing that uh, they're working on now, this, this, the, t the people who, Wim, Fabian, and all those people who are doing, working on this cache stuff, uh, there's a new project called Refreshless, um, and uh, Wim Bleers uh, had a really, really interesting perspective on performance in CMS. He said, you know, if we're worried about um, the environment, if we're worried about being energy efficient and so on, the best way that we, uh, as Drupal, you know, as, as internet builders, the best way that we can help the world is actually make our CMSs faster and more efficient. So, fewer calls to the server, fewer data transfer, f less server load, right? We're actually saving electricity and saving time and stuff. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of an, an interesting idea. So anyway, so there's this thing called refresh less, and remember everything that I've told you about, um, about uh, granular caching and cache tags and this ability to, to, to decide whether to, uh, you know, when to deliver content. So if you're on a Drupal 8 site with refresh less activated, um, your site knows everything that's on the page that it's showing you, and when you click another link on the same site, it knows the difference between the page that you're on and the page that you're going to, and it only loads the stuff that's different, and everything else, it just leaves it there. Sort of like a, a super giant um, Ajax call style thing, but this saves even more time, even more um, energy, and makes your site even faster. It's incredibly exciting, um, and this is only, you know, We've only had Big Pipe and Drupal for, for you know, I mean, Drupal 8's only been out for six months, so, so or, well, mathematically, like, seven, eight? Anyway, this is really, really early days with this system, and we're doing all this incredible stuff already. So we're delivering out of the box for free. You turn on Big Pipe. It doesn't take any configuration. You're delivering incredible perceived performance for your site visitors, which, you know, that delivers a huge amount of business value. We used to be really, really incredibly self-sufficient and really idiosyncratic and really individual. And anyone who's a great, great Drupal 7 developer is a great Drupal 7 developer, and that skill is not very transferable, and it was very, very hard for us to get um, new, new developers into our community after a while. So we went from the mentality of, if it's not invented here, we don't want it to, oh, this is um, proudly invented elsewhere, because as Larry Garfield says, who doesn't like pie? I know this is an American joke, but bear with me. Um, so we've outsourced a ton of commodity functionality in Drupal 8 um, and gotten rid of, of a lot of, uh, we've outsourced a lot of risk, we've gotten rid of a lot of code that was hard for us to maintain. Um, first and for foremost, the, um, our HTTP request, uh, um, how we did that in Drupal 7 and below was, 
well, clunky, and um, when they were talking about rewriting that for Drupal 8, eventually it came to the decision that, you know what, we're going to use uh, two components from Symfony and the Guzzle library to replace that. So thanks to a little thing called the, thanks to a little thing called the PHP uh, Framework Interoperability Group, uh, we can do that. So there's this huge thing going on in, um, um, in, in PHP land over the last few years um, where since we've had namespacing and since composers coming around and since we've had these interface standards in the, uh, and the PSR standards which define how PHP applications should work together and share information together, um, we've been able to put all of this stuff from Symfony into Drupal, and we've got this incredible theming layer and all these other bits and pieces. Our community is bigger. We have more eyes on our code. That should mean that we have fewer security problems. And really, really interestingly, okay, um, we're also moving to a world where we're doing PHP like everybody else is doing PHP so that we are now able to hire developers more easily, um, people who have done anything object-oriented in the past, and object orientation has been around for a very long time, can now open up Drupal and, and understand much, much more quickly what's going on. So, and this also, and I, um, I kind of hate to tell you this, but you learn to use Drupal 8, you learn to be Drupal 8 developers, and you have a set of really valuable, transferable skills. You will be better developers and better able to work in a much broader range of technologies. As a Drupal 7 developer, you're able to work in Drupal 7. As a Drupal 8 developer, you really, really have skills that are broadly applicable. If you know how to use Twig, it is the theming layer for more than 100 other projects, right? Super standardized. Um, Twig is a great example of why outsourcing um, and, and adopting other open source projects to work with us is a great idea. Uh, unless you, unless you um, disable a particular flag, which you should never do, uh, Twig can't touch the database layer. So you can outsource your theming. You can let your themer onto your server in a way that you never could with PHP template. Um, and Twig is never going to cause the white screen of death on your site. And, you know, that's awesome. Um, and it works like, like uh, real code you, it, with IDE uh, integration and variables and loops and so on. So, you know, it's a, it's a lovely, uh, much easier to understand, uh, you know, it's, it's much closer to human readable and it's much easier for people to learn than to actually teaching them real, actual, dangerous PHP to, to make your site look good. Uh, Campbell Vertesi and I did a session at DrupalCon Mumbai about PHP Fig and the PSR standards, and the video is online, um, and uh, we got a lot of really great feedback on it. So if you're interested in the world that made this possible and, 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 and the, different, the different standards and how they came together, um, that's definitely worth checking out. Um, on my podcast, I'm also publishing a series of interviews with people from the PHP world talking about the origin of this sharing, and um, there's an interview with the maintainer of Composer, Jordi Bojano, and uh, a lot of other really, really interesting people. So if you're interested in the broader context of the world we're living in now, um, um, go check those things out. When I joined Drupal in uh, 2005, six, um, we were only developers, and if you weren't a developer, your opinion didn't really matter, and um, you know, for years and years and years, uh, we would sort of, um, Drupal's code became more and more beautiful and interesting, and, and, but usability-wise, you know, for themers, um, Morton talks about dividus all the time, and um, especially, I think what we didn't think for a lot about for a long time was, uh, hey, the people who live and work in the back end of our site, actually they have to have a good experience too because you know we would build something and throw it over the wall and it wouldn't be great for them to, to live in. And so there's been a huge amount of effort finally um, in Drupal 8. I think it's, um, on the one hand, it's the, it's the first time that the community's really put out a product. Like it's really a productized Drupal. You can download it and you can make great quite complex sites out of the box and they're very, very usable. And we've, you know, we've made it responsive and we've, um, uh, you know, made the admin interface usable on mobile, but 
this is really the first time that we've worked really, really hard in core to think of the authors and the people who are going to do, you know, write and work with these sites every day. So this is a huge, huge value to all the organizations who are actually your clients and the people who are actually going to live in your work all the time. So um, um, uh, the image manipulation is built into core. Um, WYSIWYG editing is built into core. And I know that that's really 1999, but, uh, you know, we finally got around to the idea of, of doing WYSIWYG and having real previews in Drupal instead of abstracting and abstracting and abstracting away from it like we did for so many years. And we worked directly with the people who maintain the CK editor to have an extremely tight integration with Drupal 8 so that all of the CK editor functionality that you can see, and interestingly, you can edit the editor, right? You can configure it to be anything you want within your own installation of Drupal, which is super awesome. But like all of the image stuff is um, Drupal core image manipulation, and exactly the buttons that you see and exactly what you can do in your editor is directly related to your user role and the permissions and the formats that you're allowed to use as that role or, uh, in that role. So, so you have a super, super tight integration with CK Editor. It is still wrapped in an API w which will let you put in any other editor that you want to use, but we now have a really, really beautiful WYSIWYG experience in core, and we also have um, so it was showing it a second ago, this is in a loop. Of course we have inline editing, which is huge. Now, because the entities and the data models inside core are standardized, um, it's allowed us to do a neat trick. If you're looking at your content on your website and it's in a full node, or it's in a block, or it's wherever it is on your site and you see a problem, as an editor, you can click right into it and fix it, and then it's saved and it's fixed everywhere. And so this, this ability to ed edit in the front end uh, here we see it. Look, I need to edit that. Uh, yes, quick edit. So then I get this little mask. This is on the front end of the site. I can still fix it. Fantastic. So that is super fun. I think, does everybody in the room, well, let me ask this the other round. Who doesn't know about views? Views is one of our killer apps in Drupal. Like, apart from our community of super smart people, views allows us to take a data set right, from any data source we want and query it and say, I only want to see, you know, um, black shoes. I only want to see pink shoes. I only want to see wooden shoes. I only want to see shoes written between June 2015 and December 2015. Um, I only want to see dangerous shoes. I only want to see shoes built in Slovakia, whatever it is. And then I want to this selection of content that I have that I have defined, I want to display it. I want to render it out in some form. And it's a, a huge variety of different ways that we can display it. So this has been something that Drupal's been good at, really good at since Drupal 5. Um, so uh, this is an amazing tool. And as I was saying before, the most amazing thing is there's a single checkbox in Drupal 8 which will make any view a REST endpoint. So Drupal's killer app is now exportable as a web service as well. It's hard to express how much business value this is, um, this is giving us now. And it's in core. It's directly downloaded. It's for free every time you download Drupal 8. Um, the coolest use for this uh, REST endpoint func uh, functionality that I've heard of so far is in the uh, um, in Switzerland, where they're using uh, the NP8 distribution that uh, MD Systems built, and there's a local, um, you know, Südostschweiz uh, sort of, uh, what are they, like media organization, like, you know, national radio, TV, broadcasting, publishing organization, and um, they have editors who are producing headlines every day, and on the headline list, uh, uh, it's a view, of course, and that view is exported in a web service that goes on to... Um, the buses in the region, and you know they have like the screen that's showing the next stop, and then like the screen that's showing the ads and the local headlines. They're just doing all their work to build their newspaper and their website, right? And if they check a checkbox, right, this is an important thing. It goes into a queue, and it gets displayed on all the buses in the region because the buses know to pick up this, uh, this web service. Oh, fantastic. And it comes for free with Drupal 8. Um, those of us who work with code, um, 
configuration management. We could talk about this for another hour, but essentially, um, as much as in, to, 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 to a great extent, we've separated code and content apart from each other now. The, uh, sorry, I, didn't, I said that wrong. Configuration and content are now separated. Um, they used to be all just mixed together in the database. Configuration has mostly been moved to text files called YAML files, which is another standard PHP world technology. Um, and the YAML files, because they're just text files, hey presto, we can version control them. That means I can export configuration from anywhere into anywhere else and deploy it and test it. And all of a sudden, we have a, 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 a a nice way to do uh, deployments for the first time ever. Um, instead of uh, Angie Byron's cl classic method, which was um, write down all your configurations on a napkin and make sure that you then click them all back into the production site, right? Like, so we've all been there. Um, Everything is now entities and fields, okay? The data model's been standardized across everything internally. So um, <clears throat> I guess Drupal's, one of Drupal's other killer apps ever since we had a Flexi node and then CCK, and now entities in core, and now everything is entities and fields across. Um, you have no special citizens, no special data citizens inside of Drupal anymore. Um, users and nodes and comments and everything else are all just data, and you can handle them. And so, you know, you can build a party entity, and then you can field it with time and date and location, right? And you have a, you have a party entity, and then everything is fielded that way. Um, Comments are fields, and because any field is an entity and it's fieldable, then I can put comments on anything. I could put comments on, you know, I used to be able to just only put comments on nodes, now I could put comments on users or anything else I want to. Um, you can put comments on comments if you really want to. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but um, you could. And <laughs> So this, this, this gives us huge, huge interesting flexibility in building our data models. This is also, I mean, a huge, really important topic for those of us who are building, putting these things together. I'm glossing over tons of this stuff. Um, um, and hey, block types in Drupal 8. So everybody, you should probably know what a content type is, right? It's a data model for content. Well, now we have block types. You define a block type, and then you can make multiple different instances of that type of block. Um, for example, maybe you need a block to put advertising on your site or to hold a special piece of JavaScript or something. You can define that as a type with a script field on it and then deploy that in multiple places however you want. And they're reusable, and so so blocks are reusable in multiple places, and we have these, this block type concept now. Fantastic, amazing, make sure to check that out. It ha people haven't been talking about that very much yet. So, and all of these semantic field types are in core. Um, so an email knows it's an email, a phone number knows it's a phone number, a date knows it's a date, and so on. All of these work in views as well, and because they all know what they are, we get neat tricks for free, like we get native date picker widgets, um, native phone number widgets, uh, native email fields that are also validating that they're real email addresses. And all of this was possible in Drupal 7, but this is all still out of the box in Drupal 8. So. Um, we have all this interesting semantic data that is also organized according to schema.org schema. And selling this to your clients is really, really uh, um, pretty easy in a lot of cases because, you know, when I search for restaurants in Munich um, or television shows or book reviews or movie or software or, you know, the schema.org has uh, th thousands of different Yep, one, perfect, one minute, I'll, I'll do it in two. <laughs> Google doesn't have rooms full of people in some third, fourth, fourth, fifth world country typing in when this restaurant is open and collating all of the reviews and deciding what price class it's in and putting photos of it, right? Um, this place was smart enough to have good data online. So if you, you tell someone, if they put their website in Drupal 8 for free, they're getting 
very highly structured, very accessible, very clearly marked semantic data so that your, what your website is putting out is just not text and, and crap, right? It is putting out your phone number, your opening times, whatever you want to tell people, your site is telling that to the internet. Google, Bing, search engines, um, all of the new sort of uh, content publishing gardens that we hope to kill because we're open source and we don't like that, all of them understand Drupal 8 output instantly. So um, just by choosing Drupal 8 to build their site, they're getting free advertising in one of the most uh, important forums that we have in our digital world. The very last point I want to talk about. So Drupal 8.1 came out in April. The Drupal community proved that we're committed to this concept of semantic versioning and that we are going to release significant new features within our major version. That We never had this in Drupal before. The last time a significant new feature was added to Drupal 7 core was five or six years ago, okay? In Drupal 8.1, the last time we added significant features to Drupal 8.1 was a month ago. Um, we added Big Pipe. Uh, if anybody wants to help Drupal 8 <clears throat> get better, we need help writing the migration. We need uh, we, uh, setting up the migrations from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, especially the Drupal 6 to Drupal 8 migration still needs work. But all of the migration modules are now in core. CK editor added language and spelling buttons in April. Um, automated JavaScript testing in Drupal 8 is now possible. Holy crap, another amazing topic that's going to allow us to develop uh, Drupal much, much better and faster. Um, and the admin help page was um, uh, uh, modified to highlight core tours. We were all incredibly excited about tours four years ago. We've forgotten to talk about them. Tours need some love as well. The point here is, um, what we're going to have is um, Drupal 7 is going to be supported as long as Drupal 8 is out. We're going to improve version for version across Drupal 8, uh, keeping backwards compatible APIs. And we're going to keep going. And it's not just going to be 3, it's going to be X. It's going to be N versions that can get better over time. So look, a ton of my friends who are core developers have never worked on a living, breathing, live release of Drupal 8, they've always worked in a very theoretical, beautiful place in the future, right? And whatever they screwed up and left us with in the last version, well, we can't change that anymore, so, you know, we'll fix it five years from now, right? Now, we don't have a Drupal 9 branch that's open. We can tell them, look, here is a problem, or here's something that could be even better. Please go look, up, look at it, and you know, six months from now, a year from now, they can fix it for us. So I think we're going to get much better Drupal, and I think that the fact that everybody's working on the same version together is really powerful and a much better arrangement than what we've had before. Um, by the same token, if you have a great idea for Drupal 8, you could get it into core a year from now, and not whenever Drupal 9 comes out. Furthermore, for your clients, Drupal 8 is going to keep on innovating and stay relevant for much, much longer because we can adapt it to um, technologies that are still not there yet. So what happens is we're going to maintain this and the core developers have promised to as much as possible keep backward, the, uh, backwards compatibility in the APIs and when something happens where there's a break in that API, that's when we open, that's when we cut the Drupal 9 branch um, and the most exciting uh, sort of vision that I've seen about this, um, I hate to say it, but if you go look at Typo 3 CMS 7, it's pretty amazing, and we're just lucky that um, it's only really used in Germany. Um, upgrading through their versions, upgrades in Typo 3 are super easy. And we go through incredible amounts of risk for our community and our technology by making our upgrades really, really, really difficult. And the big challenge that I would like to put to the community now is to make it so that we don't make major upgrades a huge risk point for our community anymore. So what happens if, well, the Drupal 9 API is actually just the Drupal 8 API with the one thing changed that we think needs changing, or what if we make the last set of Drupal 8 APIs equivalent to the first Drupal 9 APIs, like with a double layer in the APIs, and then over time, the, 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 so you can make your module at some point Drupal 8 slash 9 compatible, 
and then it'll just keep working, and the, the upgrade to Drupal 9 is very painless because the AP, and then, you know, at Drupal 9 point something, the legacy compatibility gets dropped off, and we move forward. Would be fantastic. I would love to see it happen. Um, it's not there yet. Anyway, so semantic versioning actually really, really has a lot of potential to, uh, to help us out in the future. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Answer my one question here, please. I will be here all weekend. I would love to talk with you. Um, check out my podcast. If you have Drupal 8 projects you want to tell me about, I want to write about them and tell the rest of the world. Uh, if anybody still uses QR codes, that's where my survey is. Nobody uses QR codes. Um, I work in open source, and this project and everything that we do is the result of the work of literally thousands and thousands and thousands of our friends. Um, so thanks to all of them. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really looking, to spend, looking forward to spending the weekend with you.